a two-week photo journey with Jeff Carlson and Mason Marsh. This is Mac Voices. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Text Expander by Smile, the makers of world-class software. Visit TextExpander.com slash podcast to learn more and download your free demo. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, this one's going to be a little bit different today. Uh, I'm happy to welcome back to Mac Voices for a, a different kind of discussion, the hosts of Photocombobulate, Jeff Carlson and Mason Marsh. Jeff, Mason, welcome back. It's great to see you. Great to see you. Hi, right, it's great to be back. So I say this is going to be a little bit different because this is going to be a, a discussion that you have had part of already on your show about a trip that you two took. And I, you talked about it from the photography standpoint, um, but I, I had a few questions about things just from a prep standpoint, a business standpoint, all of that. So oh, yeah. I'm going to let I'm going to let one of you start the story and explain where you went and why and what you did, and then we'll go from there. Okay, um, I, I will jump in and, and give like a really rough overview, and then Mason can jump in further. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you for being on Photo Voices today. This is this is a, a really great <laughs> rebranding and <laughs> taking over of your podcast. <laughs> Taking over your show. Uh, so we went on a photo adventure. Um, it was originally going to be a workshop that we were going to be teaching. And because of the threats of wildfire smoke and anxieties related to COVID, some of the people who were going to go decided not to go. And we had to cancel the event. But we had time already blocked away. I know, <clears throat> excuse me, I really need to get out and uh, escape some deadlines. No, no, that's not the right word. I had to, uh, I've been working really hard. And so I, I couldn't just continue on that, that track. Um, and, you know, and we have like, you know, legitimate reasons for going and taking pictures for work stuff. So we just went, I got in my car and I drove to Portland where Mason lives. And then we got in his Jeep and we went down to the Sierra Nevadas and did 10 days of a photo trip where uh, I think we camped more than half of the days just in, in mm -hmm. tents, um, in, in, in cold, cold tents sometimes. <laughs> and, and like we were able to just do that thing that you dream about or talk about, which is we're going to spend almost two weeks just focused on photography and travel and, you know, getting good images, which, you know, uh, we can use in various projects and such, getting a lot of uh, fodder for our podcast and all the things that we do and the education that we do, and just sort of being photo nomads, really. Uh, and it, it was great. And the weirdest thing happened, I, for a brief, brief glimmer of a time, uh, I became a morning person. Which uh, is weird. So that's that's the big overview, and I'm sure Mason can, can jump in because he is much more of the planner, and I would say the brains behind this. I was just the 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 good looking co pilot. I don't know. <laughs> Wow. I mean, oh. that jury's still out on that one. But yeah. uh, okay. wow. <laughs> Mason, jump in there. <laughs> quick. That kind of a show. Okay. Uh. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, we, we had planned this workshop, and, and I still want to go down there and do a workshop, perhaps uh, maybe as early as next spring. We have a lot of clients who would love to come with us on a trip. Everybody's sort of chomping at the bit to get out of the house. And, uh, you know, probably no one more than me. <laughs> So uh, it was also an opportunity for us to scout locations. So we had this block of time, like Jeff said, but we also had a lot of locations that I had been to before, but it had been years and years and uh, some locations that I'd never been that were part of our workshop plan. And so this was a great opportunity to kind of cover our bases so that when we finally do get to do a workshop down there, we have that local knowledge that is so important when you do a good workshop. Um, so we wanted to check out some coffee shops and restaurants and photo locations. It, it, what a great, you know, 
what, what they call that work in some places, but um, <laughs> it was a really, it was a really great trip for us because we didn't have the constraints of having workshop clients with us. Uh, we were working, we were making lots of photos and we were thinking a lot about, um, you know, logistics, how, how long does it take to drive up to this particular spot? Would it be a good place to have people out walking around? Is it a safe spot? Things like that. So as a workshop leader, there was a lot of that happening for me, but 80% of this trip was just fun. <laughs> it was just <laughs> a, a chance to be out with my good friend, Jeff, and make some great photos. And so, uh, well, it, you know, I'll call it work, but it's barely mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so this is the thing on all the workshops that I've done. Um, like, there's definitely that component of I'm on vacation because I'm doing something so totally different than what my day to day is, right? Like, amazingly, I'm not sitting in front of a computer all day. In fact, uh, you know, the computer time was really, really minimal, uh, partially because of things like, you know, d uh, make sure we had power and, you know, battery limitations. Um, you know, we we did not anchor ourselves at a hotel like we normally would with a with a workshop, and so um, you know we camped in a bunch of locations, and so it it like it does kind of feel like a, a, a vacation of sorts, but you know my my brain I felt was always working because you know we are looking at where to go we're looking at weather conditions we're looking at you know what's what's nearby what can we see what will not be there because there's smoke like which areas just that we had planned to go would, you know would not deliver any sort of photographic results at all and i mean it it sounds it sounds funny and i, I almost sound guilty saying this because we were really just you know driving around and taking pictures but big stretches of our days that we thought would be the time that we would go to our campsite hang up a hammock and you know take a nap in the middle of the afternoon after waking up at five o'clock in the morning we would spend driving trying to find photo locations looking for fall color um and so on paper it it like like it almost sounds relaxing, and yet, I mean, I, I was exhausted by the time we got back. Even though I think I slept more in that two weeks than I had the, the the two weeks previous. So it's this weird combination of uh, yes, you're you're out doing something that's kind of vacationy, but maybe maybe because you know we were thinking of it also from the workshop perspective, it's also work. It's also trying to engage your brain all the time looking for photo opportunities and things like that. So, boy, there's so many things I want to ask, but one that really <laughs> jump, jumped out at me as I listened to you two describe it, uh, describe the, the whole two weeks, is how many times you all ran into other people doing classes or workshops. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I, I haven't gone out and taken a lot of pictures, but I don't think I've ever run into anybody just randomly doing a photo workshop so i'm clearly not going to the right places <laughs> and i'm 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 joking but i'm also serious because i was really intrigued yeah. so i mean there's some obvious places let's say you go to the grand canyon or whatever mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. you can understand why that would be but you you two seem to run into a whole lot of people at a whole lot of different locations is, is that yeah common it, in this in this kind of thing it's, it wouldn't be common if you went to the places we went to at other times of the year, but because of the fall color, the Eastern Sierra has a couple of windows every year where it's spectacular. It's always spectacular, but especially spectacular. Uh, enough so that people would want to travel from around the world to come there for a photo workshop. And so fall color is a big draw uh, in the Eastern Sierra. And Bishop, which is kind of the central town, in the area we were working is uh, is known for having really great fall color around it. So I expected that we would encounter a couple of workshop groups. In fact, when I was planning our initial workshop, um, 
I went out and did a search. One of the things I always do when I'm planning a workshop is I try to see what other people are doing in the area and see if we're going to be competing for, for locations. Um, and if we are, I try to see if I can flex our schedule so that we kind of spread out a little bit. And so I, I expected to see a couple of workshops because I knew that, frankly, Chuck, I knew that even though we canceled ours because of the wildfire smoke and because of COVID concerns, that there were other people who were just going to be like, you know, damn the torpedoes, we're going to go ahead and go for it. And, you know, those are the folks we ran into. And I'm really glad we didn't hold our workshop because it was smoky. We dealt with a couple of days. When we were chasing fall color around Bishop, there were a couple of days where it was unhealthy <laughs> levels of wildfire smoke. Yeah. And it certainly, it made for some interesting fall color photos, but it wasn't that beautiful blue sky that you look for when you're shooting orange leaves. You want that, you know, comparable color. Uh, blue and orange is such a beautiful <laughs> composition. And so we had orange and orange. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad that we went and did it, but I'm also glad that I didn't have paying customers there. Um, that I was, you know, going to try to help get them great shots and have them be disappointed because it was smoked out. Yeah, but that I mean, I would think you'd run into that kind of thing anytime with photo workshops. Probably more from a weather perspective than necessarily a smoke perspective. So at some point, you know, somebody signs up for one. Yeah, you pays your money and takes your chances. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, weather's always a consideration. Um, in fact, I always hope for some weather because that tends to make for dramatic skies. Um, with California, though, now <laughs> in the summertime, especially in the fall. Uh, so, you know, the fire season in California is now, you know, 12 months out of the year. But you can pretty much count on smoke in September and October. And that it, it, it'd be almost like doing a photo workshop in hurricane country, knowing that you're going to have a hurricane. You know, it's, yeah. it's, I don't know if it's, if it's smart. Uh, so when we we're looking at these locations, one of the things that I kept coming around to is maybe this is a spring type of thing because we could mitigate the smoke by coming at the time of year where we're least likely to have fires. Uh, and so that would be maybe April or May. So that's, mm -hmm. that's my thinking on that. Well, and I, I think we did run into some groups, but, um, I never felt like we were ever fighting for space. And, and the, this is sort of one of the things that, that we talk about in the episode is, um, you know, a lot of times we would run into a group and maybe they would be set up for, for like one thing. So for example, we went to the Alabama Hills, which is this amazing rocky place. They filmed literally hundreds of movies there. Uh, if you've seen Star Trek, you know, the, the old series where they would go to, <laughs> to, you know, beam down to a planet. You'd have these like funky rounded rocks and all that. That's where that was filmed. And they have these like beautiful arches there. And one of the things that, 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 that we were going to shoot was, was this arch. And uh, you've got uh, Mount Whitney coming through the middle of the arch. It's this, you know, really nice composition. And you have to get there, of course, early before sunrise. And we got there and there was already a group set up, but they were all, I would say, you know, at least half of the group or most of the group were just sort of packed and perched on this rock. So they would have that, that one view and it's a great view, but we weren't going to go and, you know, try to climb on the rock with them. And <laughs> so, so Basin and I, we, we just sort of took off in different directions and looked for other compositions and things like that. And I think that, that that was kind of the only time that we ran into people who were sort of, quote unquote, you know, in the spot that we had in mind. But it still worked out fine because the sun came up, they got their shots, they took off. I mean, like literally the sun come up, boink, there it is. And then they left, hopefully to go find, you know, some other great location. And then we just explored the area. Um and, you know, we meandered over and got on the rock and took some pictures there. And, but I don't know, it never felt like we were, we were fighting for space. The, there, there are some times in some places where you're, you're kind of fighting for space. And I think some of that was, even though this is a busy time because of the fall color, it's also um, sort of off season for tourists. So you're not really fighting, you know, the, the, the looky-loos. 
who are you know, just sort of like, oh, I don't know, really know what I'm doing, but here's a picture. And you're like, I've been up since 4.30. I, please, I just need this shot. <laughs> um, that was a little bit too dramatic, but you know what I mean. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Smile, the makers of Text Expander, my most used productivity utility. I've been telling you about Text Expander for a long time now, but it still surprises me to get emails about users who just don't get why I'm so enthusiastic about it. So let's go through it with some examples. With Text Expander, you type just a few letters and it expands out into whatever you have told it to. So, for example, three Ds might expand into today's date. Your three initials might expand out into your preferred version of your name, with or without your middle initial or middle name. Or a two or three letter combination of your choice could expand to your phone number. Those are things you type frequently. You can save time using Text Expander, but almost as important, those snippets will always be accurate. And that's even more valuable when we start talking about sentences, paragraphs, or pages of information that you can summon with your favorite snippet. I've got more examples on the power of Text Expander coming up, but for right now, I want you to visit textexpander.com slash podcast to sign up for a free trial. That's textexpander.com slash podcast from Smile, the makers of world-class software. Thanks to Smile for their ongoing support of Mac Voices. <laughs> yeah. So how do you go about preparing or packing for a trip like this? Uh, not as much clothes, but uh, well, but of course, where you no, guys were, yeah, yeah. You, you had to take some serious clothing considerations um, to keep from freezing to death, I would think. Um, but I mean, how do you how do you determine what gear to take? Uh, because you obviously don't want to be packing everything f from a, a lot of different categories. Yeah, from security, you don't want to be carrying around that much stuff if you can avoid yeah. it, because um, you never know you know who you might run into but you also mm -hmm. want to have everything you want or need to get the most out of it. So how do you go yep. about selecting what cameras to take, what computers to take? This is actually a really good question. And um, I, I have a really easy answer. Uh, you ask Mason. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, Chuck, I, I spend a lot of time <laughs> obsessing about this. Um, in fact, I <laughs> would have to admit that a big part of the excitement of a trip for me is the preparation for it. Um, I really milk that process. So uh, to answer your question, I always bring more than I need um, with the idea that I don't want to be in the middle of a field somewhere and open my camera bag and be like, man, I wish I brought that lens because that would be perfect right now. I, it, a lens that's sitting in my closet at home does really nothing for me um, when I'm making photographs. It, it hardly ever comes in handy. Um, in that closet. So I, I brought everything. I brought everything as far as camera gear goes. And, and I was able to pack it all into um, one camera bag. And so it, for me, for security, one, it's all insured. So I don't sweat that too much, but I don't want to just like leave it on the hood of my car either. So I packed everything into my camera bag and it pretty much stayed with me the entire trip. Um, as far as technology, aside from the camera gear, I opted to go with just the iPad Pro and uh, the iPhone 13 Pro. And for me, that was a really nice um, traveling setup. And I'd spent a lot of time thinking about maybe I should bring a laptop. Uh, I've got an old MacBook Pro that I oftentimes would bring on a trip. And because we, I knew that we were gonna have power um, restrictions. You know, we weren't always going to be around a plug. Uh, I opted for the iPad because I can charge that from a battery bank. Um, and so I carried a couple of battery banks, iPad, phone, uh, card reader, and I was good to go. And Jeff had work, a little bit of work to do, so he had to bring a laptop. And so he had a bigger technology bag than I did. But as far as the other stuff, you know, you can't overpack if you're traveling by car. <laughs> <laughs> you can just stuff it all in there. And so we brought, um, you know, all the camping gear that we might need. We brought, ex I brought extra blankets because I didn't know how cold it would be. So I brought the stuff I knew I'd want to sleep in. And then I brought, you know, 25% more. Uh, as far as clothes, gosh, you know, I knew it was going to be fairly dry. But being a Pacific Northwest guy, I still brought a raincoat. Uh, <laughs> because the second you don't, it's going to rain. The... Uh, the big thing, though, was insulation and, and being warm in 
being someone who shoots a lot of sunrises, that's the coldest time of day. And so I prepped for those sunrises. I, I knew it would be down near freezing or maybe below freezing. And so I, I packed for that. And then uh, I knew that we'd be up into the 80s on a lot of the days. And so I, I packed for that. And so we had these big bags. But the great thing about traveling with just one other person in a car is you just have that whole car to fill up. And so we did. We looked like a couple of uh, hobos out there. Just had that car loaded down and, <laughs> and went from spot to spot, uh, shedding layers, putting on layers. You know, it was, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, Mason mentions the the two extremes, like, you know, really cold mornings and then getting up into the 80s um, and didn't say that oftentimes that was on the same day. So, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're early in the trip, we, we started at uh, Crater Lake in Oregon on our way out of Portland, uh, spent the night there. And when we got up to the rim of Crater Lake, uh, there was an early uh, snowstorm that had happened. And so it was about 26 degrees and windy. I had, I think, six layers of clothing on. Um, and fortunately, the wind was at our back. So that was a, a lot more manageable. But it was a cold, 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 cold morning. Uh, you know, and, you know, you're trying to use your hands and you know, be somewhat you know, coherent and creative and all of that. Um, and so that was good and bracing. Uh, and we made coffee somewhere and then headed off. And our destination was, um, you know, in the sort of Davis area of California. And I think when we arrived there, it was 86. So, you know, you just had to have a lot of different options and be able to, you know, have a, a lot of layers, a lot of like, you know, light layers. And, you know, like for me, I brought a puffy jacket that was perfect because uh, when it got cold, that would warm me up. And I think maybe, maybe because we both live in the Pacific Northwest, you know, we're like, yes, of course I'm wearing layers. I'm wearing two layers right now. Um, but just having that at our disposal made a big difference. I think if we had, gone somewhere where we were flying in that might be a completely different consideration we didn't even try to do a minimalist packing knowing that we would just have stuff in the car um and you know like that's a completely different mindset okay um you both mentioned now a couple times power and that that yeah. me would judging by the 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 way you portrayed this uh this trip it sounds like you really didn't have a lot of chances where you would have access to power or a lot of Wi-Fi or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe maybe cellular, of course, but but not necessarily Wi-Fi. So yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah, not yeah. In some places. <laughs> yeah. So so Mason, I get it. You you're able to charge an iPad from a battery bank, but the battery mm -hmm. bank has to be recharged at some point too. So yeah. unless you have a battery bank the size of your car battery. So you know, <laughs> we actually did bring one of those. You um, brought one of those. Yeah, yeah. I should have known. I should have known. Jeff's got Jeff's got this car. It's actually a you could jumpstart a car with, and he actually used that to power his laptop quite a few times. Um, so yeah, the great thing about modern cars is most of them have tons of uh, you know the old cigarette lighter, the, the twelve volt plugs. But my car's actually even got a built in inverter, so it's got an actual AC plug in the back, uh, which we used. And so I would have like my drone batteries charging as we drove. So I just left that plugged into that. And when I got through a drone battery, I'd just plug it in and leave it and it would be charged up eventually. But we also sought out coffee shops. You know, Jeff and I don't go far without looking for coffee. It's really, um, when you plan a trip like this, it's connect the dots between all the great coffee shops of the West and, <laughs> and just follow that path. And so we went into a few coffee shops. There was one in particular in Bishop. We went in and we must have looked kind of strange. We had our backpacks, uh, you know, our, our little tech bags. And we walked in and we're like looking at everybody and, you know, where are the outlets? And this particular coffee shop had tables everywhere. It was quite a large coffee shop. And they had these plates under the tables where there used to be outlets. And I, I got actually kind of outraged. I was like, how dare they, you know, cover those outlets? Uh, what kind of <laughs> antisocial people are these? Um, are these folks. And we ended up sitting outside uh, 
at a picnic table with no power. And we didn't go back to that coffee shop. We found one that had an outlet <laughs> inside. And uh, we ended up kind of over using that outlet. I have a photograph I can share with you guys of, I think we had 10 or 12 things plugged into one outlet. You know, we had all these extension cords and power strips and things. So we found power and that was where we would charge up our battery banks, put our back camera batteries onto chargers, um, plug our cameras in, all the, all the things you can do. The great thing though, Chuck, I got to say, we're entering a gilded age for recharging. Almost everything I have now can be charged with USB-C. And so I, you know, I have a plug that's got like four USB-C slots on it. And I just jack everything into that. And if I can find one open outlet somewhere, I can charge four things at least at once. And it makes it so easy. You don't have to carry a big bag of cords and all these different chargers. You just have some USB-C cords and you just plug them into the things that need the juice. And it makes it so much simpler and, and easier. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I've, I was, and, I've, oh, sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, and I should point out, even though we did camp a lot, uh, we, we broke that up with inexpensive hotel stays. And so, uh, you know, we, we'd camp for two or three nights and then go stay in a, you know, little rustic uh, wood paneled <laughs> hotel room with lots of power outlets and just, you know, charge, charge everything overnight. So, um, yeah, like, I mean, power was definitely a consideration for things like that power and being able to take a shower uh, was <laughs> it got to be pretty high on the list. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I know what it's like for me, just, you know, trying to pack, say to go to a, to a, a conference or a trade show that, you know, the power is a big thing, uh, especially, you know, when you're on the ground and using whatever devices you're using, and yeah. you, I mean, you're right. You know, everybody's always huddled around the plugs. I mean, you go to an airport, you <laughs> see people, you know, huddled around plugs. You know, I've 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 actually taken to carrying a small power strip so that I, if I can find a plug somewhere, even if somebody's already plugged in, I'll ask if they, you know, could we maybe unplug and plug the power strip in, and that way we can share. Um, yeah. So th that's yeah, that's I, I hadn't really thought about the the fact though, Mason, that you you were in a car, so you would have that option. Might not be as efficient as an AC outlet, but gets the job done. Absolutely. You know, and I will say, if there was an item that became sort of the central focus of our attention on this trip, it was our iPhone 13s. And Jeff and I just recorded a podcast episode yesterday that will be coming out next week about our experience with the, the new iPhones on this trip. Um the battery capacity of these phones is tremendous. I never had a point where I was worried about my phone running out of juice. And part of that was because whenever we were in the car, we were plugged in. And Jeff actually has this really ingenious little, um, it's not MagSafe. What's the, the magnet on the back of the phone? I can't remember the name of it. Um, but he actually had a mount that on the dash that he could just t tap his phone onto it and it would stick there and charge up. And, I was driving and I would look over and Jeff would put it on the charger and then he'd take it off the charger and do something. He'd put it back on the charger and he'd take it off the charger and do something. And it was back and forth off that charger, maybe hundreds of times a day. And it just kept it topped off and it was really brilliant. And I think that Apple, you know, seeing as how this is a, the Mac voices show, I think Apple has done a masterful job of making on the go charging and battery capacity effortless. And I, coming back from that trip, I was like, I need to get one of those magnetic car mounts. And so I've got one on order so I can just pop it on there and it's charging. I don't have to fiddle around with the cord or try to unplug the cord while I'm driving and get the phone out of the cradle. I can just, you know, slap it on there. So it's, it's brilliant. And, um, these phones were critical for us for weather tracking, for, uh, tracking the smoke, uh, looking for restaurants and coffee shops, uh, booking hotels. You know, we did all this stuff on the fly and we did it all through our phones and our cellular coverage was spotty, but, um, you know, we were always able to get done what we needed to get done. Okay. I'm, before I forget this, I'm going to ask you if, if you two don't mind later, I'm not going to start put you on the spot now, but if you would just send me a couple, uh, some links of some of the, some of the gear we're talking about, uh, that you found sure. most valuable so I can put it in the show notes 
Um, because I, I think that that'll be the first thing people say is, well, which one of those four outlet chargers did Mason have, or which car mount did Jeff have? So you mm-hmm. know, if you don't mind sending those over. Um, sure. One other thing I wanted to ask about, though, you know, you've talked about a lot about some of the the shooting and you know, the surviving on the road, but what what does your photo workflow look like? Um, so you you stop somewhere, you take take a shot or you shoot all morning, then do you stop and upload those photos or transfer them, I should say, I guess, to the iPad or a, a Mac? Um, or do you? is this just strictly a shooting trip and there's no editing and no backup and you just archive the uh, the SD cards? What 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 is that? And, and do you do any editing on the road? Yeah, Jeff and I are going to answer this question differently because we both have different workflows, which is you know, how things should be, right? So um, I use the iPad Pro, which is not what I would use at home. Normally, I'm, I use Lightroom Classic uh, on my desktop computer. And so when I'm traveling, I do a traveling workflow, which is temporary. And so I would plug my phone, or sorry, not my phone, my camera directly into my iPad using a USB cable. Uh, and then I import my photos off of the card in my camera into my iPad. I have a one terabyte uh, iPad Pro, the big 12.9 inch iPad Pro. And so that's running Lightroom. And I import those items into Lightroom and make copies onto the hard drive, onto the the memory in my iPad. That then, as soon as I can get to Wi-Fi, starts syncing to the Adobe Cloud. And when I got home, I actually had all of my images already on my iPad as a backup. I kept all of my originals on the SD cards. I didn't format any cards on the trip. Um, When I got home, I just had to get on my home Wi-Fi and let the iPad catch up. And it took about a day for my thousands of images from the trip to come off my iPad through the Adobe Cloud and down onto my home hard drives, which is where all my raw files live. And so it was a really great workflow for me um, because I had my backups in the field. And it's very important for me to have backups in the field. As far as the editing, um, I did a, quite a bit of editing on the iPad. And there's some constraints to my workflow. I shoot a lot of panoramas. I love shooting a panor- multiple image panoramas. And what that entails is assembling those panoramas in Lightroom. And Lightroom on the iPad won't do that. So I knew that a lot of my work was going to have to wait until I got home. Uh, but my single image shots that I wanted to play with. I could do that on the iPad really easily. Lightroom on the iPad is fast. It's an M1, so it's super fast. Uh, And using the the Apple Pencil makes editing really fun on the iPad. And I was able to move stuff over to Instagram and Flickr or wherever else I wanted to share those images while we were on the road. It's it's hard for me to wait until I get home to work on my images. I really enjoy (laughs) having some time on the road to start to drink some coffee and sit and play. So we did that quite a bit. Our conversation with Jeff and Mason about their photo adventures continues in the next edition of Mac Voices, where we wrap up a discussion of workflows, talk about lessons learned, and a whole lot more. Until then, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com Bandwidth provided by CashFly at CashFly.com.